In this unit, we will study three different approaches to analyzing users' tasks. Hierarchical task analysis involves describing users' tasks in terms of the activities involved at different levels of detail. Superficially, it looks a bit like the GOMS analysis that you studied in Unit 7, but, as you will see later in this unit, it is concerned with larger-scale tasks in the work domain, rather than user tasks involving the details of thinking and acting with a particular device. Knowledge-based analysis involves creating taxonomies of objects that are important within the work domain. Entity relationship modeling involves describing the entities, objects, and actors involved in the domain and relationships between those entities. You may have come across this type of approach before if you have studied systems analysis, but don't worry if you haven't. In this unit, we will cover how to create each of these types of representation of a task and how to use that representation to reason about design. We will focus most on HTA. In the discussion of letter writing, we saw that very similar end objectives could be achieved in very different ways, using different tools, pen or word processor plus printer. The two scenarios describe similar domain tasks, what their user is achieving in the world, but involve different device tasks, what their user had to do, using the available tools, to achieve that effect. One of the most important challenges of design is often to ensure that there is a good fit between the domain tasks and the device tasks. In an ideal world, the device would be almost invisible to the user, not in the sense that it cannot be seen, but in the sense that it is not noticed. When Nograd and Flores, 1986, page 36, discuss this by drawing on the analogy of a hammer, if you are hammering in a nail, things always go best. When you are unaware of the hammer itself, it is just an extension of your hand, and the hammering action is fluid and easy. Then you bang your finger, and suddenly, that flow of activity is broken. You are intensely aware of the hammer as a separate object, and you have to work hard to restore the earlier productive hammering action. Tools should be ready to hand in the way that a hammer is to a carpenter. The user should not be fighting with the tool, but using the tool easily and naturally to achieve their tasks, almost unaware of its existence. Of course, there are cases where the computer system is the focus of the activity. A good computer game is engrossing. But, it does depend on the computer system being there and visible. It is the focus of attention. However, even in this case, the user should be able to focus on the game rather than being distracted by pictures going jittery, the sound fading unpredictably, or other unintended features. Of course, games are not the usual focus of task analysis, which is more commonly concerned with the productive kinds of tasks that are found in work environments, offices, factories, etc. In the remainder of this unit, we will focus our attention on the kinds of work tasks that have a clear goal, typically an end product. Task analysis of any kind starts from data, information about the work, and the work setting. For HTA, the data that is needed is data about procedures, about how activities are structured into tasks. For UP and KB analysis, the data that is needed concerns objects in the work domain and their inner relationships, and maybe also the actors, people that are essential to getting the work done. In the scenarios above, we talked about going into Linden's and Remy's offices and observing them. Implicitly, while observing them, we were also taking notes about their activities that could be used later for analysis. Observation and note-taking, or even video recording, are one way of gathering the data that is needed for task analysis. Another way of getting such information is by interviewing users, that is, the people who perform the tasks being studied. Again, responses can be noted by hand or recorded using a tape recorder. Each of these techniques has advantages and disadvantages. 
interviewing is often more efficient than observation. As people talk about their work, they use a particular vocabulary that expresses their understanding of what they do and how the work that can usefully be adopted in any computer support for their tasks. You find out how they think they perform their jobs and the things that they perceive as being important. Unfortunately, people are often unable to articulate what they really do. This may be because they are so immersed in their working environments, so familiar with the way things work, that they take much of their knowledge for granted. Often, the most important things about the way they work are the ones that are most obvious to them, and therefore, the ones they will forget to mention. Also, as they become experts at their tasks, they forget all the details they develop, compiled skills which becomes difficult for them to break down and describe fully. To take a simple example that may be familiar to you, if you are driving a manual car, as you pull away from a junction, you will change up the gears. When do you change gear, for example, from third to fourth? What is the detailed procedure you follow as you change? Do you take your eyes off the road for any reason? Learner drivers are very aware of the procedure, each foot movement, each glance, in the mirror, the act of feeling. For the gear lever, maybe looking for it, are all deliberate actions. As expertise develops, the conscious awareness of the process diminishes. To understand users' tasks in detail, it is often necessary to observe them, to identify taken for granted knowledge and compiled skills. A third source of data for task analysis is often existing documentation. There may be procedure documents that describe how tasks should be performed, which may or may not describe how they are actually performed. And what follows, we are assuming that data has been acquired from somewhere, and we focus on ways of analyzing that data. Before we start, though, a note of caution about the limits of task analysis, it's no good for revolutionary design. Every now and then, a totally new kind of design appears on the scene, one that really changes the way we do our work or think about interaction. Two of the examples from recent years that you will be familiar with are the graphical user interface, GUI, which moved us forward from the text-based command line interfaces of an earlier generation and made computing much more accessible to non-specialists, and the World Wide Web, which has revolutionized information access and hastened the globalization of interactions and commercial transactions. For every high-impact success like these, there are untold numbers of failures, revolutionary ideas that simply fail to catch on and faded into oblivion. Contrast these with the word processor, which evolved from the typewriter and retained many features of its predecessor. Each generation of word processor has moved a little further from its origins as users find new uses for the current generation of machine and adapt their behavior to the new possibilities which are then designed and to the next generation products so that we get co-adaptive behavior with users adapting to new systems which are then redesigned to support new uses which task analysis provides good support for design evolution where understanding of the current task the task structure the entities and actors is used as a starting point for new design. It is no use for design revolution, which typically involves creating new possibilities that simply did not exist before, and introducing new concepts. For example, the graphical object, or the hypertext link. Hierarchical task analysis has been in use for a long time, since the 1960s, or even earlier. It is most suitable for analyzing tasks that have a well-defined structure, that is, tasks which tend to be performed in similar ways every time, rather than those that have a very loose structure. HTA involves describing the task in terms of a task subtask hierarchy and a set of plans that define in what order subtasks may be performed or under what circumstances particular subtasks are performed at all.
There may be some other notations you are familiar with where the order of appearance of boxes in the tree indicates ordering, probably left to right. This is not the case for HTA. The only thing that matters is the hierarchy. As well as presenting the hierarchy, it is necessary to describe plans that define the possible ordering of activities. In this case, a suitable plan would be Although tree structures are visually appealing, well, more appealing than the alternatives, anyway, they can be tedious to draw without a suitable tool. Therefore an alternative text-based notation that relies on indentation is often used. We will use this textual notation to expand the task description for the letter writing task. 0. Write letter and prepare for posting. 1. Prepare for writing. 1.1. Get paper. 1.2. Get envelope. 1.3. Get pen. 1.4. Get address book. Not explicitly stated, but clearly necessary. 2. Write letter. 2.1. Write own address. 2.2. Write addresses, address. 2.3. Write date, and year. 2.4. Write, body, text, of letter. 2.5. Sign off. 3. Prepare envelope. 3.1. Write name on envelope. 3.2. Write address on envelope. 4. Put letter in envelope. 4.1. Fold letter. 4.2. Place letter into envelope. 4.3. Seal envelope. Task analysis involves generating as general a description as possible. As noted above, HTA differs from GOMS in that it considers only physical activity, not cognitive tasks, and focuses on plans rather than selection rules. Conversely, large-scale tasks can be described using HTA, whereas only a dedicated person with too much time on their hands would complete a GOMS analysis. For such large tasks, it would take weeks of effort to do it thoroughly. If using HTA as a guide for implementation or for detailed documentation, a fairly fine grain of detail down to the individual action level may be necessary where it is being used to help get an understanding of the domain tasks. Less detail may be appropriate. Whereas HTA is concerned almost entirely with procedures, KB analysis focuses on the things, at least in a loose sense, in the task domain, namely objects and actions. KB analysis involves creating taxonomies or hierarchies of objects or actions. Such taxonomies can be used in interface design, for example, by ensuring that related objects or actions are grouped together sensibly and that all important objects are represented at the interface. Entity relationship analysis is normally associated with systems analysis notably database design, and, more recently, object-oriented programming. So if you have studied these topics, much of this section might seem familiar to you. Be warned, however, the task analysis we are considering here should have a much broader scope than traditional ER modeling. Being concerned with the entire work domain, and not just the entities, that will eventually be represented within the computer system. Like KB analysis, ER analysis starts with the objects and actions involved in the domain. However, as well as the objects, we are concerned with their properties and the distinction between objects and their properties or attributes is clearer in ER analysis than in KB analysis. Also, we are not concerned with the similarity or otherwise between objects but with how they are related, for example, which actor in the domain performs particular actions on the objects. We have already summarized most of the important uses of task analysis, a source for generating documentation. By structuring the understanding of the task, it becomes much easier to structure a presentation of the task and user-oriented documentation, whether that 
be structured around procedures, actions, or concepts. A source for designing tutorial material. Like documentation, good, user-centered tutorial material that helps users learn to use a product is based around their tasks, so task analysis is a good starting point for designing effective tutorial material. Guiding System Design By focusing attention on the current system and its strengths and weaknesses, task analysis can be used to design new interactions that have evolved in a reasonably natural way from existing practices and to identify domain objects that need to be represented at the interface and ways of grouping those objects. Requirements Capture Although task analysis refers to the existing system rather than the planned one, it can help to structure requirements acquisition, particularly as users will often refer to the existing familiar system when discussing future requirements. In particular, users may not find it easy to list features that should remain unchanged from the existing system, so the task analysis can help focus on what should stay the same as well as what should change. To summarize, task analysis is necessary for bringing domain knowledge into the design to make a new design or procedure as familiar and sensible and hence learnable as possible. Task analysis is not easy, but then neither is good design. It takes practice and it also important to understand both the uses and the limitations of the various task analysis techniques available.